call this meeting to order. Um, Lisa, if you could uh, take the roll. All right, Joe. Here. John. Here. Greg. Here. Angela. Here. Angela is online. Here. Okay. Alex. Here. There she is. Justin. Here. Jen. Here. I am here. Candice. Here. Julie. Here. here. She's online. Peter. Here. And Mary. Here. She's also online. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask if there's any public comment on agenda items. If you are attending online and wish to comment, I need you to use the raise hand feature, please, so I know where you are, because I've got a lot of people here. I do not see anyone who wishes to speak. Going once, going twice. Okay, we'll move on. The next item is the consent agenda. Uh, there are minutes of the board meeting of September 13th, 2021 and the board retreat of September 27, 2021. Does anyone wish to remove any of these items from the consent agenda? Well, I do. I'd like to remove the minutes of the Board of Education of September 13, 2021. And I would like to call your attention to the last page of those minutes. And here it's, it's referring to seeking of legal advice. And it says legal advice is being seeked for more information and clarification. I decided to give that a, 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 a really good um, interpretation that it's seek it is what we were trying to say. But bottom line is it needs to be sought. So no one has an objection. We'll have that changed. And then uh, if no one else has any, any uh, corrections on this set of minutes, I need a vote. Does someone move the adoption? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, and all those abstaining? It appears that everybody who uh, voted in favor of it, so that's, that's unanimous. So. Uh, if there's no change to the, if there's no removal of the September 27 board retreat minutes, then they will be adopted automatically. And I don't see anyone wanting to remove those. So we'll move on to the AgriScience Operations Manager Systems, Operations Systems Manager. Okay. It is, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Margie Gert to the Board of Education. Margie is our new AgriScience uh, Operations Manager. She has uh, been charged with uh, our planning, that long range planning to recognize how do we cross pathways, find synergies within the program, utilize our students to make certain they are getting the experiences that we have promised within the program. Margie brings with her a vast amount of agricultural knowledge. Not only that, she is a board member of the region six school district. So she truly understands the seats that you sit in. Um, but more than that, I think the experiences she wants to bring to our students, what she's going to help us do with this program is taking some of the ideas and bringing them into practice. So with that, I introduce Margie Gert. Well, everyone, thank you. I'm not gonna take up too much of your time. I know you have a lot to do. Um, I will say I'm more than happy to save the remainder of the meeting. So if any of you have individual questions, I'd be happy to speak to each of you at that point in time. I'm really enjoying my time here. I started week three. I'm really excited to be here to help with this program, help the agri-science program grow and develop the program that you all envision it and see it to becoming, which is part of the vision that I see as well. Um, as the superintendent said, I'm not from Connecticut. I'm from Maryland. I grew up in the 4-H system down there. I've been involved in agriculture and 4-H since the age of five. It's been a long time. I'm not going to tell you how many decades now, but it's, it's more than three. I'll leave it at that. Um, I am very involved in agriculture here in the state of Connecticut. I've been an active 4-H volunteer for over 25 years here in the state of Connecticut, working with various aspects of 4-H and youth, developing our youth, getting them to achieve their goals in a variety of different applications. 
In addition, I also have, I had had my teaching certificate. It's currently left, but I'm working on getting that back. I taught as a long-term substitute at the Middletown Vocational Agricultural Program for a year and animal science while their teacher was on maternity leave. I've kind of kept my hands involved through my work through 4-H, through extension, helping out different vocational agriculture and agri-science programs throughout the state. And I'm really excited to be here to see what I can do to help this program thrive and grow. I've really enjoyed meeting with all the teachers, I've talked to them individually, shadowed some classes, seeing where they feel that they need some help so I can help them, you know, grow and develop their own individual program. They said, I'm really excited. I'm an open book. I don't like to hide things. I told, you know, Megan Bennett as soon as she first talked to me about my position on the board at Region 6. I let my superintendent know as soon as I started this conversation about possibly coming here just to keep everyone in the loop to make sure that it was not to be a conflict of interest. So, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have afterwards. As I said, I know you have a full agenda tonight. I don't want to take up too much of your time during the meeting itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to ID's updates on COVID. All right, and if you give me a second, I'm going to share my screen with everyone just so we can continue to go through the process that we started last year, which is uh, as we're tracking the updates and what's happening with COVID-19 within our schools. So, uh, all right, so as we have done in the past, we're gonna continue to look at our facts and figures. And this is from August 31st until today on what is happening in our district. Um, right now you can see this is our chart. Um, you can tell that compared with last year, we are not seeing some of those active cases right within our schools. However, we are seeing students who have been put in quarantine due to some close contacts. We are seeing family members who have been uh, testing positive for COVID. I have to absolutely applaud for their quick action. They are not taking stuffy noses lightly. They are looking and taking seriously any of the symptoms, getting those tests, which have allowed us to then make certain that that spread doesn't happen within our school district. So you can see um, as our chart is trending, these are what our numbers look like as of today. And again, um, when we look at the mitigation strategies, we are not at this time seeing spread within the schools. So we are comfortable as we had shifted from six feet to three feet within our classrooms. That seems to be a viable change that is not disrupting the health of our schools. So um, other things that we're continuing to watch for is that we continue with our ventilation, wanting to get fresh air into our schools. Um, and I am going to just switch to the next slide because we do know that the um, governor has recently um, changed the mask mandates. Um, the last executive order was going to end on September 30th regarding masking in schools. That has thus been extended. So the executive order number 14, uh, we are now anticipating wearing masks up through February of 2022. Um, I do want to also update, there have been some changes and we've shared this with our families. We recognize that with our domestic traveling, those who are vaccinated are able to travel and do not have to submit a COVID-19 negative test result to return. Um, but we do have that for unvaccinated domestic travel. In our work with the Department of Health, we recognize that CDC um, has our domestic travelers that are not vac vaccinated testing and then quarantining and then coming in after seven days. In our conversations, in our work with the Department of Health, um, because it is very wide reaching, um, domestic travel could mean that you're going to New York and coming here. Um, and so what we had said is that they felt very safe in changing that. So what we're asking for is in domestic travel for an unvaccinated person, they just returned to us that negative COVID test. It does not have to be PCR. It may be a rapid test. Uh, they are talking about the improvements in the testing and that would um, satisfy. So with that, we also recognize that there is a cost to testing if you're not a close contact and what that does. 
um, and we're not trying to be a financial burden to any families. So working the New Milford uh, Department of Health does offer free tests um, from nine o'clock to 1030, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So families, if they're traveling, can go in on a Monday morning, can get their test, and then um, come to us with that negative test in hand. There are some other free sites that are found around the state. We have made those known to our families. Um, so again, as we're trying to keep people safe and healthy, we are also not trying to be a burden. And because of the fact that right now we are not doing testing at the door within our schools, this is another way that we just know that people are returning from their traveling in the safest way possible. Um, we certainly also, when they turn in the negative test, we tell families, please watch for any signs or symptoms. Um, it just adds that extra layer of it, um, of awareness. So that way that, um, again, keeping us safe and healthy. So again, our goal and our goal has not changed. We're just gonna stay a step ahead of COVID. Um, and so I will leave that to any questions that uh, the board may have. Uh, Lisa. I know you've figured out the domestic travel, but what about international? International, we do ask families to go to the CDC website. Um, it does even say, even if you're vaccinated, there are some quarantine uh, okay. mandates that they are requiring. So okay. I would say consult CDC and then talk to the schools and we can certainly guide you based on, on what we see, but we are staying with the CDC with that. And that is something that DPH didn't change okay. international. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Uh, Alex? Yeah, um, I noticed- Can you uh, unmute? I'm on mute, right? You are muted, I need you unmuted. Oh, okay, do I do that or do you? You can do that. Unmute, there it is, okay. Um, I noticed on the first slide that the uh, uh, there was one staff member, then two stars. Is that because it was the same staff member across all three? It, it, well, that's exactly correct. It was the same staff member who travels to all three buildings. And gotcha. so I didn't so want rather to- Rather than put a third, a third, and a third, Absolutely. you put one and two stars. Gotcha. <laughs> I didn't know how to do a third of a person. So yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, third person's tough. Okay. Other questions? I don't see any. Okay, thank you, Megan. We'll go on to uh, reports and recognition. Um, I want to uh, again thank uh, Vice Chairwoman Jen Pody for chairing the meeting, the last meeting that I couldn't be at. You did a marvelous job. You guys spent a lot of money while I was gone, and uh, it looks uh, it all looks good. So I, I do want to thank you for that. Um, and. Uh, say that I did see a, um, well, I'll, I'll just pass on that because we have a big busy agenda. I'll, I'll mention that the next time. Okay, that's, that's more or less it. I wanted to talk a little bit about, ag, about the Ag Science uh, Building Committee. We are really close to the end of the project. Uh, we've got a couple items that are being worked on this week and maybe into the early part of next week. And there are a couple that are left over just a little bit longer than that, but we will soon be out of Dodge and 100% um, and complete with it. And so just keep, hang in there. We're almost, we're almost there and we are still under budget. So it's looking, you know, with soft costs, we're under budget. So it looks looking reasonably good. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on to the treasurer's report, John. Yes, good evening. I don't have anything on the uh, financials this evening because uh, the numbers are forthcoming but for September, but. I, one thing that I took out of the, uh, the uh, finance and operations meeting tonight was the fact that the district, and this is not tomorrow, but uh, over the next coming months and years, we're gonna be faced with a big financial uh, uh, you know, accounting for a lot of the um, necessary repairs, uh, renovations, restorations, replacements, and it's many, many millions, tens of millions of dollars. So, you know, um, the 
the reality of it all is that, you know, the, the whole region is going to have to come to a decision, whether it's cheaper to build new or to fix what we, the ancient infrastructure that we have. So I think over the next, you know, several months again, and uh, possibly years, we have to take a hard look at where the region is headed. Thanks. Sure. All right. Um, well, I, I'd like to start um, to thank our staff and families who came out uh, for the starts of our new year uh, programs. We held virtual open house sessions at each school. Uh, I appreciate families coming to listen to the curricular expectations so that way we could plan for a successful year. We recognize that in-person is something that we're still craving to move towards, but we also recognize we'd have to limit the amount of um, family members who could attend in person. And we felt that the push was really understanding the curriculum and what the students are gonna experience. So um, we continue to, to look at some of those events that we host year to year and look for opportunities to, to have some normalcy, but also try to get what is the essence of what we're trying to look for and make certain that that comes through in all of our planning. I wanna give an update um, about AgriScience um, program. And um, during my last superintendent's report to the board back on September 13th, I talked about our sheep's delay to campus um, because they were quarantined. Um, one of the sheep had tested positive for CL um, but since that time, we did have two additional animals, um, so we will not be able to return that herd back to our campus. Um, but we do have a safe campus to return uh, new species and animals to um, because our herd never came back with that diagnosis. So um, we did take additional precautions, but I wanted to let people know, I know that we get very attached to the animals, but we also know that as part of the agri-science program, we are gonna rotate species year to year. Um, so we will be introducing goats and chickens within the next two weeks. Um, we are very happy to have our horses on campus. They seem to be thriving. Gulliver is back and just as lovely as he was last year. Mm -hmm. um, and number 200 still doesn't have a name. So um, I'd like to have that happen because it feels awkward having a horse named 200. Mm -hmm. um, so other things that um, are happening is uh, we are very proud. We gave a tour to the Newtown superintendent, their high school principal and board member. And um, just to share one of the statements was our students are so lucky to go here. And I think I hear that whenever tours are happening, there is absolute awe for what you have designed and planned in these facilities. Um, it really is top notch and it is felt and seen by those who tour it. So I know it's a lot of extra work, Greg Kava, but it's paying off. People are actually really happy with it. And it, once it's finally completed, we will all breathe a sigh of relief. Um, so other things that have been happening and we always talk about COVID, but I want you to know our, I wanna thank our school nurses. They provided flu clinics right here for our staffs. So they are taking efforts to make certain that we are healthy in all aspects of, of our um, personal well-being. And um, certainly we do not just have that one track mind. We know that there's other areas that uh, need to be cared for. So we're still helping our staff stay healthy. Um, I would love to congratulate right now um, our Chicago senior Wyatt King. Um, he had earned the honor of being a commended national honor, uh, national merit honor recipient of the scholarship. Um, he is not only a top-notch student who is a great test taker, um, but it's also, he helped present the drama production last year. He was a student director. He will be the student director again this year. Um, also participates on our debate team, is in the Model UN, is on the World Affair Forum, and he really elevates so many of these conversations. And so I know his star is bright and we're looking forward to hearing more about his achievements. He's not done. And we know it's gonna be absolutely amazing. So kudos to Wyatt. 
Um, I do want to let everyone know we do have homecoming that is coming up this weekend for our games. Um, the homecoming dance will be the following weekend, but um, I want to publicly thank Matt Parachi um, because he heard um, our girls soccer players were actually scheduled to go to Litchfield for a game the day of our homecoming here. And whereas we asked Litchfield to switch, um, you know, and so we'd play a home game, we understand these are competitions and they did not want to give us home field advantage. Um, and so we were trying to navigate around ways that we could make it special for the girls soccer team and not have them miss out. And what they came around was that um, we will ha have their homecoming game on a different date, but we have since um, rescheduled the Litchfield game. So it will be on a different day. So our girls soccer players can be out there enjoying the, the homecoming games, cheering on our field hockey players and our boys soccer team. And a special thank you to Jen Pody for the idea of a bonfire that night. We were not able to do the games under lights. Um, and that was something that really got some emotions um, moving. And we were trying to figure out how to have homecoming and we were meeting so many obstacles. And a wonderful idea was to why not have a bonfire that night and allow students to get together. We'll have the food trucks there and it's really been pulled together nicely by the Chapag administration. Um, but this is where when you say, this is definitely a place where when you hit an obstacle, we look for a way around it. And I think the resolution and what's happened is really a way to celebrate our athletes celebrate the achievements of Chapag and to make certain everybody's included. And I think that's really important. So um, our games will start on Friday, October 8th at 345. A reminder, we do not have school that day. Um, it is a teacher professional development day. So we expect full a lot of energy because you know we would not have been you know taxing them all day long. So um, that is at 345, bonfire is at 630. And um, the homecoming dance will be held at the Washington Pavilion. Um, they are taking huge steps to make certain that that is a celebratory environment, lights and, and all the excitement that homecoming is gonna be. And of course, in the safety of being outdoors so they can take those pictures and they can remove the masks to have those moments together. And I think that's really important. So we're very excited about that. And um, just quick sports update, our cross country team, our girls cross country team is currently six and zero, oh, um, which is absolutely outstanding. And again, I, I think I, I shared with you last time and the fact that we have 13 girls from eight towns is, is just, it's an amazing thing of coming together and also doing well on the field. So kudos to them. Um, I can tell you that they um, all had performed well the last two weekends at Invitationals. Uh, we had a third place team finish at the Wizard Invitational in um, Washingtonville, New York, a fifth place team finish at the Winding Trail Trails Invitational at Farmington. So congratulations to Eilish Foe, to Faith um, Bargellini, and to Emma Perone, who all earned medals. And... Um, Again, they're now competing on October 12th at a home meet, and they will be going against the undefeated Northwestern and undefeated Litchfield. So I, I think we can take them. And uh, the boys soccer team uh, has had a very strong start to their season. Mm -hmm. They won their first five games. All good things come to an end for a moment, but I'm gonna <laughs> say that does not mean that's our downward trend um, because I think I even saw a, tr a tweet from uh, Coach Stinson, who said, if effort could be put on the scoreboard, we won. And I think that really goes to the heart that's going there. So um, again, we're, we're immensely proud of the efforts. And um, not only are they performing well on the field, they're performing well in the classroom. So it's been a good start to our year. So um, if there are no questions on my updates, I would just like to share. We have some people who are leaving our district. Um, we say goodbye to Rachel Vanier. Uh, she's been an educational assistant at Washington Primary School. Uh, Michael McManus, who was our College and Career Center coordinator, um, and Charlene Sullivan, who's been a paraprofessional for us this year at WPS, but was at Burnham for a number of years. 
and we wish them all very well in their future and their next step of their journeys. So with that, Craig, I turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so there's nothing new to report. Um, we do have a meeting coming up on October 25th. So okay. that's all I got. All right, in advance. There is a director's meeting, annual director's meeting um, for Ed Advance on this Thursday, which I will be attending and hopefully I'll have some news after that. Okay. Uh, finance and operations, Alex. Well, our meeting ended just less than an hour ago, but I'll give you a quick update on it. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, enrollment, and we got a presentation about solar panels, uh, potentially uh, at the Washington primary and at Booth, but the one at Booth is a little different than the one at Washington primary. Uh, two of the selectmen were here. Um, it looks like it could be a win-win situation. Uh, Don had some serious concerns, which they're going to address. Uh, and we will get back to you. We're really only on the first inning of this, but before any uh, decision is made, uh, we will obviously bring it before the board. Uh, uh, John uh, quickly mentioned uh, the projects that need to get done. Uh, Don O'Leary is gonna put together some, uh, some numbers, hopefully, so that we can give uh, uh, the board and then eventually the individual three towns, different options of what we can do. Uh, our uh, infrastructure here needs some serious work and uh, what direction we take and how we do it has to be considered. Uh, finally, we uh, uh, talked about the agri-science uh, uh, business model. Um, it's turning out to be quite a profitable uh, uh, operation and uh, we project it uh, getting better next year, which will be our fourth year so that we'll be complete uh, with uh, all four grades in the agri-science. Anyway, that's what I've got. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them now or after the meeting. No questions, Alan, thank you very much. As Ms. Bennett said last month on labor negotiations, we had started, uh, we were about, we were scheduled to start with the, um, with the uh, non-certified staff, clerical and paraprofessionals. And we did in fact start and we are, uh, we will have more negotiations tomorrow. So those are continuing. And that's where we are on labor. Um, strategic and long range planning, Julie. Yes, we had a meeting yeah. on Monday, September 20th. And I have a, few things to report on that. Uh, we did discuss our long range plan facilitation process, which as some of you know, we had delayed, but we are ready to go forward with a potential plan. And we'd like to have the board hear a presentation from the Connecticut Center for Change. This is an organization that we had selected last year that we think will help us do a great job with our long range facilitation process. So. We'd like to schedule that for an upcoming meeting. Uh, on the school signs, they're in place except for the Chapog sign. We continue to wait on materials for that unless there's another update I don't know about, but that's where we stand with the signs. We also talked about tuition in and our cost and capacity there. And we do have some recommendations for the board for some very modest increases in the upcoming year, not this year, obviously, but the following for our tuition in program at the middle and high school levels. I'm not sure if now's the time to go into those details, but at some point we'd like to present those small changes to the board. And we also discussed the idea of the PTO liaisons, which I think are an action item scheduled for later. And just to tee that up, 
the idea would be that each of the PTOs has a board member from their town that they sort of can connect with and communicate with. This has been happening at some of the elementary schools, but not all of them. And we think it would be a nice program to sort of put in place and have be standard across all of our schools. That's all I've got. And Mr. Boucher, as you're coming up, we truly appreciate, I know this is gathering a lot of numbers and you stay in touch with our alumni and make certain that you're getting all of the information. And we just, we truly appreciate the relationships and connections because I think you bring to life the, the class report and thank you. There you go. All right, let's, let's start that again. So again, I'm uh, Mike Boucher, Director of School Counseling here for Region 12 uh, and at Chapag, and I'm here to discuss the Class of 2021 report. And you know, I'd be remiss if we didn't just start by saying, I think we all expected uh, what happened last year, right? You know, in person, distance, we all saw that coming. Just, just kidding. Uh, it, was, it was a year like uh, none other, and there were challenges and obstacles and um, you know, we have an amazing faculty across the district, fantastic staff, uh, amazing community, uh, amazing parents, and I just wanted to publicly recognize uh, the efforts of the Board of Education, Superintendent Bennett, uh, school leadership, school staff, uh, and, and everything that went into last year to make it possible. Um, there's a reason why kids want to come to Chapag. Uh, and it, it, part of it's in here and part of it's in the community, uh, but the real heroes uh, in my eyes uh, were our Chapag kids and the Region 12 students. And in particular, the heroes I'd like to talk about tonight are those from the class of 2021. You know, whether it was blowing us away with unique senior projects that range from, uh, you know, making a Range Rover that literally didn't run into a functional camper, uh, or, um, you know, <laughs> um, building a tree house in a 20 foot high tree um, that, you know, a kid actually had to learn how to weld um, in order to make this happen. So there's some really remarkable things that this class is doing. Um, and like I said, you know, they're the real heroes uh, from this. And, you know, if, if there was any meaning, um, any, any one uh, class that really exhibited Chapog pride, you know, like last year was was very difficult for many reasons, but they persevered and you're going to see in this shining report on all the accomplishments. Uh, so just to kind of outline the class profile, um, this is, you know, as of graduation, uh, we've been in touch and we've been updating, obviously, because we want um, accurate records, uh, but we had a class size of 57 students um, of those 57 students, 90% of them were accepted to post-secondary programs. When I say post-secondary programs, that's all encompassing. That's not just college, uh, that's technical school. Uh, that is uh, other trade programs. Uh, for instance, we have a young lady at a CNA program. We have a young lady at a cosmetology program. Something we do really well at this school is we encourage students to follow their passions uh, and we don't, you know, like we're gone are the days where you have to go to college to be successful, right? We want kids to follow uh, their path, but we are there to guide them and to help them make that unique plan, uh, whether it be entering the military, whether it be attending a four-year college, whether it be attending uh, trade school or other certificate programs or going right into the workforce. Uh, we have a little bit of everything uh, here at Chapag, even with our smaller class sizes. So. To, to kind of break that down a little further, uh, of the 57 graduates, 44 are attending four-year programs. Uh, so that's a pretty high percentage. We have two uh, that are in gap years. And, and 
gap year doesn't mean just sitting around doing nothing uh, for a year. Gap year, you know, the definition continues to evolve uh, year to year as you see programs, uh, new programs coming out. And, you know, we have one student that is uh, doing a gap year in Costa Rica. Okay, so that and, and you know, gap years also could be uh, just as expensive, if not more expensive uh, than a year of college tuition. So uh, this is just a continuation of that self-discovery, really figuring out what you want to do with your life uh, through different activities. So we had two students uh, exploring gap years. We had two students uh, enlist. And I have to say, you know, our military families, uh, we have so many in this district and we are so honored and proud uh, of these of these individuals. Uh, last year, I want to say we had 10. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a small graduating class. So that just goes to show, um, you know, the service that our kids are putting out. We have four attending two-year institutions or technical programs. So this is including community college, uh, CNA programs, certificate programs, uh, cosmetology schools. So the two different community colleges uh, where we have representation this year are Naugatuck Valley Community College and Northwestern Community College. Uh, we have four uh, students that went right to the workforce. And then we have one student that is at a postgraduate program, which is a continuation of pre-collegiate pre -collegiate academics. Um, you know, just just to show you uh, a little bit, I'm not, you know, the screen looks like Ben, if, if um, we can get that a little bigger on there. So there's a sampling of um, two and four year uh, programs that our kids are attending. And, you know, looking up at the screen, I have beyond 2020 vision. I'm not quite sure I could read that just now, but there we go. Perfect. Uh, so the sampling of intended majors. So if you want to just go up. And I do have to say, since my guy right here has helped me out, uh, the amazing pictures that you may see um, on this presentation, they're all compliments of this guy. Um, you know, we, we do a really good job um, at marketing our, our brand, as I say. And, and you know, Ben, ben is... Uh, Pretty talented with these pictures, so I had to thank him uh, again for these wonderful pictures from graduation. Here's a sampling, and this just goes to show, you know, the diverse um, and uniqueness of this class. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about future educators, we're talking about future engineers, we're talking about future politicians, neuroscientists, you name it. Um, this graduating class is nowhere near done yet. Um, sky is the absolute limit, and you know. I would even go on to say that we have we have kids that are gonna, uh, you know, change the world in some way. All right, so we're gonna move on to uh, the class of 2021 AP Scholars. So as the AP coordinator uh, for Chippewa Valley School, I have the uh, fun job of working directly with College Board um, and ensuring that our students have. Um, you know, the, the means to, you know, take the AP exam, uh, do well on it. Uh, but last year in particular was, was super challenging since there were three different test windows. Uh, there was test session one, session two, session three. Uh, and you had the ability to take it in person or virtual. Uh, we decided as a school that we were going to do it in person, uh, you know, unless there were students that were absent and they had the opportunity to make that up in a virtual fashion. Um, but even before that, something that is quite remarkable about this school is the percentage of students who take on these advanced placement classes. Uh, kids really want to challenge themselves, and it really showed in this class. Um, of our 57 graduates, 43 or 75% of the of students took one or more AP classes. I, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and even more remarkable. 21 or 37 percent took four or more AP courses throughout their tenure at Chicago Valley School. Four or more. That's 37 percent, close to 50 percent of the class. That's that's just goes goes to show that our kids really enjoy learning uh, and they do it well. AP Scholar Program uh, that rec uh, recognizes students who have met benchmark scores on multiple AP exams. AP exams, you can get a score of zero for literally doing nothing uh, through five, five being the top. Um, so there are four different designations. Uh, AP Scholar is awarded students receiving scores of three or more uh, on three or more exams, three or higher on three or more exams. Uh, AP Scholar with honors is awarded students receiving average score of at least 3.25 on all exams taken 
and scoring a 3.1 or higher on four or more of these exams. AP Scholar Distinction, uh, earning an average score of 3.5. Uh, or higher on five or more exams, and then AP National Scholar is granted to students uh, who achieve grades of three or higher in at least eight whole year AP exams, and who have an average of four for all their exams. So for the class of 20, uh, it should be 2021, my apologies, uh, we had AP, eight AP Scholars. Uh, so the first designation, we had one AP Scholar with honors and five with uh, AP scholars with distinction. Answering a call to citizenship, uh, as you're aware, we have a 30 hour uh, graduation requirement for community service. And you know, our students uh, more than contributed. Um, and you know, this is even more impressive considering we were, it was March 13th when we, when we went home for distance learning in 2020, right? So they were in their junior year um and community service opportunities uh were limited uh to you know vir to virtual uh for for a good portion of the year of 2020. um even with that being said and the limited opportunities uh our kids still contributed just under 3,000 hours collectively and that's 57 students you know that that's that's pretty that's a pretty great uh accomplishment and this year's community service award recipient accrued over 300 hours. Um, just to kind of put that into focus, five students completed over 100 hours of service in that graduating class. Uh, 2,994, so literally just under 3,000 hours as total as a class. Um, and, you know, it, it went through, there were community service ventures like uh, mission trips that happened obviously prior to 2020. Uh, giving back at elementary schools in the local community. Uh, our kids really uh, answered their call to citizenship and we're extremely proud of them. As far as future education plans, uh, in this document, uh, we have outlined all of our plans for our students of the class of 2021. Um, and this is all encompassing. This is not gonna just include uh, for universities. Uh, as you see right here, you have CNA program uh, in Torrington. Uh, there are two different uh, military, uh, two, two different students that enlisted in the military. We had, again, uh, really prestigious acceptances, uh, but our class of 2021 um, is well versed, uh, very diverse, and they're doing their thing. And I remember at this last presentation, uh, our board chair, uh, Mr. Kava, uh, pointed out something that had bother, been bothering me a little bit too um, about our US news. Um, you know, with the selective, highly selective, I understand why it exists, um, but you know, I don't think it does all of our kids justice. So this year, when preparing uh, the college acceptances, I did not go with the US news, highly selective, um, selective approach. And I just wanted to list. Uh, where our kids were accepted, uh, because you know, regardless of the prestige, uh, I think that we have a pretty remarkable list of colleges and universities, and our kids are really, um, you know, answering their call and, and getting things done in the classroom. And with the U.S. the U.S. news report, um, I just I wasn't comfortable with it. Um, and this year we went with just the approach of listing our college acceptances which can be found also on our webpage. Um, and I'm going to slowly try to make this thing. Can you make this a little smaller so we can get the whole thing on here? Sorry. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Pretty extensive list. Uh, our kids were busy applying to college last year. Um, and I'll end by saying exactly what I said in the beginning. Uh, th this class, instead of making excuses uh, for the challenges that the year 2020 and 2021 posed, uh, they rose to the challenge, uh, they conquered, uh, and they are pursuing their dreams. 
and I could not be more proud of a group of individuals uh, than I am. And that that is all encompassing. That's not just the students, it's the staff. Um, you know, really proud to be a member of this community. And thank you very much for allowing me to present tonight. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to student achievement during COVID with next steps. All right. Um, so coming off of Mike Boucher, who's celebrating all of the things that we've done and everything we are, and it really was a remarkable year, but it is one in which I want to make certain that we're not overselling what happened and that we are recognizing that we did not go unscathed during this pandemic, that there was academic impact. And um, so I, I'm going to just take a moment, I'm going to share with you a quick, and we will not take long on this other than to just share with you perspective. So um, back pre-COVID, so, when our students took the Smarter Balanced Assessment back in 2018, 2019, um, we saw that the average um, percentage of students who were meeting their target and what was achieved was for most students well above the 60% the mark. Um, we really were hitting those targets. We, you know, if a student was level one and low, we gave them intensive support to make certain they couldn't get to their next tar target level. Now, that does not mean that their target level was always proficiency on the test. It may have been this is where they need to grow in order to then make it to eventual proficiency. So the state gives you targets for each child, and we work at through data analysis to figure out how we can best support students so they can meet those achievement levels. And as you can see, our, our staff took this very seriously. We worked to accomplish, and no, it wasn't 100%, but we were certainly closing gaps for achievement. Um, then we have the pandemic. There was no assessment given in the spring 2020. Um, and in the administration of the spring 2021, the State Department of Education is not using that data source to measure growth. They recognize that the pandemic is not one that you can say is the trajectory solid for all students because I think we all saw a deviation from what the potential trajectory was. So what the State Department decided to do was that we were gonna administer the Smarter Balanced Assessment in the spring. So it gave perspective. How is our district doing in comparison to other districts around us? Um, how are our students doing towards the standards that we have set before them? Because we also have to realize that the pandemic's recovery is not, I mean, we always say it's, 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 it's the marathon, it's not a sprint. We didn't make it through last year and our students are okay and right back on track. We're still trying to recover and we're still looking for those opportunities to accelerate learning. So, um, that's how we are using that Smarter Balance Assessment. We are not using it against students' individual growth, but we were, are using that information to determine what are our next steps as the district. So when we look at our Smarter Balance results, um, what you're going to see, math took a pretty big hit in, in our district. I'm actually going to show you um, the information um, on the next slide that'll give you a little bit more of a synopsis, but you're going to see right now in third grade, we have 77% of our students who are proficient or above. Back in 2018, 2019, we were at 85%. So these are drops from what we typically have seen. You look at mathematics for that same grade level and we are looking at 67% proficient or above. It was at 93% before the pandemic. Now we understand there are factors that happen. You know, We understand this is a different cohort of students, but I don't wanna take away from the fact that 
we had advantages being in school. We had advantages of our students having in-person learning opportunities, but they were not the same in-person learning opportunities that happened before COVID. So there were decisions that we made um, that right now we are not running our foreign language program at the elementary school because instead we're running additional intervention supports. Um, we did take the money from the um, ESSER three funding and we um, decided to fund a tutor at each one of the schools in order to support some of that recovery to make certain we are looking at what are the deficits and how do we now excel based on information that we have here? There are going to be things that we have to leave behind because otherwise we're going to see a compounding of the curriculum. So we certainly look at that continuum of instruction and say, what do students need to know? How are we catching up? What does that recovery look like? Which does take some acceleration. And Teresa DeBrito is doing a lot of that heavy lifting with teachers, but it is taking a considerable amount of professional development. Um, so looking at that synopsis of scores, and as I said to you, when you look at what happened in third grade, where we are at 78%, whereas before COVID, we were at 85. Um, we talked about mathematics. Mathematics across the board dropped, with the exception of seventh grade. <laughs> um, our seventh grade students did better <laughs> after the pandemic. And you're going to see some fluctuation in ELA. Actually, our middle school students did do better than they typically do. But it is one I think when we really analyze the scores, what we see is the greatest impact, and I don't think this surprises anybody, is our youngest learners. I think when we had to go to remote learning and some of our students who may have had to be independent learners who may not been, have been able to keep up with the curriculum to then come back and try to land in both worlds to not have access to all of the phonics because you know masks are on or how we're trying to change instruction six feet apart where they can't talk about those things it has impact so in as much as we are the fortunate it doesn't mean that we came off where our students are just cruising along and there's no changes so what we are currently doing um, is that as we recognize that student achievement has been impacted. That's not just a region 12 thing. Um, we are currently looking at course sequences. So for the high school, um, as we go through our English courses, we are recognizing things like in social studies in our middle school, they did not cover African studies. And we're now recognizing there is no other time that that happened if we did not get it that year. So what are we doing to make, make certain that our students do not miss out on some of those, those meaningful and needed opportunities for learning? So we're looking at um, that information. So whereas last year we adjusted finals to reflect the learning that occurred, which means I can't compare finals from 2019 to finals in 2021 because we did not want to do um, we wanted to do no harm for students. We wanted to make certain we were assessing them on what they learned. But it also means that um, we now have to take a look at what wasn't covered and where we're going to infuse it and how we're going to do some of that compacting. Um, you know, our goal was health and safety. We never veered from that. That was what we put down as the superintendent's goals. It was every administrator's goal was health and safety, but it means that now we really have to double down on academics. Um, we are currently administering local assessments so we can get that real time data. We're using that for all of our professional development to determine what needs to happen with individual students. So it's not just smarter balance. That's one piece of information. Now we're collecting local information to see what we need to do in order to recover. Our professional development is focused on instructional practices and data driven decision making. We talked about our partnership with the University of Pittsburgh, um, the IFL. They are working with us for instructional coaching. So this way we can find opportunities for learning. Um, as I shared with you, we looked at literacy tutors for our funding sources. And currently we're looking at curriculum changes. We're reviewing schedules. And this is where you're gonna hear the Chipog administration. They're gonna present to us throughout the year as we're reviewing what is the best decision to go forward, um, as well as what are those instructional coaching measures that are really gonna be paying off. So it's 
again, a situation where I don't want to have rose colored glasses on where we pretend we made it through a pandemic and we just celebrated being here. It wasn't enough. Our children deserve more, but how we capture that is not to overwhelm our students, but to make certain we're presenting things that are meaningful and in a way that is best suited for their learning throughout their time in Region 12. So with that, I will bump if there's any questions on the information, but I wanted to make certain that the board knows um, that we did, we did have impact. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the next item, which is the October 1 enrollment data. <laughs> because you guys had so much fun listening to me talk last time. All right. Um, so um, our enrollment data continues to fluctuate, fluctuate a great deal. Uh, I had presented to the board during our retreat and conversation that if you look back at uh, the years past, um, back in 2019, our enrollment was 688. And then we go to last year, we got up just over 700. Um, it was 701. And to now be this year, where we are at 763. And so some of the reasons that we are seeing the fluctuation is last year, we did not have REACH program fully enrolled. Um, additionally, we um, are still growing our agri-science program. So as you see some of these numbers, it's also agri-science agri stabilizing. It is important to know that our number got as high as 812 during the summer. And when you look at 812 versus 763, some of that is agri-science attrition. We had some students who after the pandemic just wanted to be closer to home. Um, we did have some families who uh, reached tuition, got as high as um, 52 students at one time. And if you look at us now, it is 35 students enrolled. And some families decided they didn't want their children in masks. So they made the decision to wait out another year. Um, we are watching our kindergarten numbers. We had some students who waited um, a year to now come to enroll this year. So we're seeing a lot of fluctuation. This is nothing like what the Prada report had promised us was gonna be sitting in our classrooms in 2021. And so as we start to make decisions, I think we need to recognize we need some stabilization before we start to say, what does this mean for the district? Um, but I certainly wanna make certain that people see that right now, agri-science, our number is 119 students for everyone in agri-science. Um, of those 119, 75 of them are from send, our sending towns. So I wanted to make certain that we also recognize that the amount of district students, so students who live in Bridgewater, Roxbury, and Washington is 594 of the 763 students. So we have a large number of students who are not within our three towns and who are enriching our students' experience being here. So um, any questions that people have, it is still in draft form because um, we pull these numbers from October 1. As you know, the state asks our information from October 1, that's where all of our funding comes from. So these are preliminary numbers. I wanna make certain the board had them in front of them. Um, I will make certain that these are finalized. So at the next board meeting, um, you'll have hard and firm numbers, but I think it's important that as you're making decisions, you see where we are at this point in time. So questions, concerns about the enrollment numbers that have been provided. Can I ask a question? My question is actually pre the previous about the COVID. Um, update and I apologize for not asking it but it just dawned on me now mm -hmm. for the students that need to quarantine mm -hmm. we're we don't have zoom as an option no. so can you just talk to me or us a little bit about how those students who are quarantining at home are able to I, I just wonder like because if you have one student that has to quarantine three or four times mm -hmm. that makes a huge impact on their 
educational experience, correct? Is it okay if I deviate? Uh, I, I apologize. I, no, it's okay. I want to make sure. Is it, there's no enrollment questions? Are you okay with me answering? Because no. I know that this is something yeah. that a lot of parents want to know. No, the, no, that's fine. But I, I don't want to go to it if there's still enrollment questions. So I'm hearing no. And... I apologize. So, no, no, that's all right. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to break up. No, the I understand. So go ahead. Mother. All right. Um, and yes, we had to change how we presented to our students who are learning at home. Um, part of the reason that I think we were not as effective last year is because teachers were teaching both in Zoom and in person and trying to divide that was just not doing justice. Okay. So what we've done now is that anybody who's been placed in quarantine um, is then given their learning asynchronous. So their, their work is put into Google Classroom then what happens is they have individual time with their teachers. So they have between 10 and 20 minutes. They meet individually every day with their teachers to make certain that they're understanding. Additionally, um, we have now um, our National Honor Society students are also giving their service hours to help out students who are in quarantine, as well as the literacy tutors who we talked about because those are an add-on. But I'm going to say you asked the very important question. That's for the one-offs. Yeah. That's for, you know, I have to go out in seven days. Here's where I'm going to keep up and keep going with the class. However, um, we do have a situation right now. We had one family who's been so impacted. We're now talking 24 plus days. And for those things, we have absolutely taken and done some very special things in which um, utilizing the tutors where they get longer periods of time. Um, you know, if there is a teacher who does want to Zoom and want to have that because we want to give them part of the experience, we are individualizing that. The other thing that happens is, is we also um, utilize Ali O'Hara as pupil personnel uh, service and kind of a at-home tutoring situation, mm -hmm. even though it's through Zoom, mm -hmm. they do have that, that opportunity. Um, so it's a lot more individualized rather than generalized, okay. um, which is the way that we decided to go this year. Mm -hmm. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, I, I think our focus is now in the classroom for those teachers with in-person learning. Makes sense. I, thank you for the explanation. Nope. I... We, thank you very much. We will move on to Dr. DeBrito's presentation on teacher evaluation. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. I will be sharing my screen. And I came before you about a year ago um, with the same topic as the state for the past couple of years has um, deviated from the legislation regarding teacher evaluation. Last year, there was a heavy focus on social and emotional learning and there were no summative ratings. Typically part of the legislation requires that teachers have a rating and that that is an aggregate submitted to the state at the end of the school year. But um, last year and the previous year, there were no um, ratings for teachers. So the difference for this year is that we are still focusing on the needs of the students. Social emotional learning is one aspect, but certainly student achievement, student engagement are also other areas that teachers can review their student data to see what are those goals that will meet the needs of the students sitting in front of them. Other things that are staying constant is that there will be um, observations of teachers teaching in the classroom and a consistent is a review of practice that the teachers every year have to really have a focus for their particular growth. And um, that will still remain for this year. There will be post observation meetings as always all observations will include written feedback. So it's very similar to what they were used to before. In addition, stakeholder feedback is very important. And so getting input from families through surveys is still a major component of the um, teacher evaluation for this year. 
if there are areas of concern needing individual improvement or remediation plans, those are still also available. And again, this year, teacher evaluation summative ratings will be included. That's a change from the past couple of years. They were not getting a summative rating. So just coming before you to share what those flexibilities are for this year. And I'll be back again um, because the state is currently revamping um, what is currently asked of teachers. And so there are committees at the state level that are looking into being a bit more innovative in how teachers are evaluated. So more information to come, but wanted to make sure that you also were informed of some of the flexibilities for this year. So Megan, you might want to contribute. I, I think you did a great job. Sorry, I was gonna echo. I think you did a great job. Um, you know, I know that this is a lot of work. I know that the state has changed the flexibilities and how we're measuring, but for us, we wanna make certain that whatever we're measuring against, that it, it is tangible. We're looking for growth in how um, students are, whether it is social emotional, what does that growth mean? And, and how do we capture that? Or whether it's academic performance, how are we capturing that? So uh, I, again, we're, there were some things that as we got looser on last year, tightening that back up because success has to mean something and how we define that. And I think uh, you and the PDAC committee did a great job on how that was gonna be captured. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to one of my favorite topics TikTok challenges and school response. Um, I don't know if you've been paying attention to this phenomenon, uh, but there has been. Um, uh, at least two different instances in which um, there were nationwide, um, I don't know, I, I, incentives is not the right word, but at first there, there was something about uh, committing vandalism basically in school, school property and then posting it onto TikTok with your picture and your identity on there. Which is interesting because if you're going to commit a crime, usually you don't sign your name to it. But that's that's what we had uh, going on uh, across the country, and I even think we had some of it here uh, in our district, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, but then we we decided to th that got topped by the next TikTok adventure, which was to slap a teacher um, and uh, and post that. Uh, I can tell you that our uh, high school principal, uh, our, our uh, middle high school principal was right on top of that, uh, put out a very um, important and uh, unfortunately necessary communication to everyone to let them know that this kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated. Uh, and to make it uh, certain, in no uncertain terms, that if you assault a, a uh, a teacher or a staff member of Region 12, uh, you will face immediate disciplinary proceedings, including being referred to the uh, being referred to the criminal authorities for assault. Um, and that's just not going to happen in our school. And I don't think we have had anything uh, along those lines so far as uh, I know. Uh, I don't know what's going to be next. Slug a school board member? I, I, this is just ridiculous. I, th yeah. There. Um... There is every month has its own challenge. Um, November is apparently um, kiss your friend's girlfriend. Um, December has, um, I, I don't really want to say it in a public forum, but encouraging, you know, pulling out of private parts. Um, so it, I guess when you look at all of them, they're all heavily male dominated and encouraging you know, male aggression towards females, which is, you know, something that should probably be spoken about as well at a school and district level. 
Well, no doubt we will use this for an educational, uh, uh, to try to do some educating with this, but this is, uh, obviously we've got a lot to look forward to in the months ahead. So um, uh, I honestly don't know the answer to this, but this is, this is where social media has just gotten just nuts. And, uh, you know, the idea that this kind of behavior would be encouraged by anyone, whether it be peer to peer or, or in any other way is just uh, is a sad commentary on the world we live in. And I'm sorry to say, but this school is going to stay on top of it. The school system is going to stay on top of it. And this kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated in, in Region 12. Come on, guys. I, I, you know, I mean, there are better things to do than engage in this kind of behavior. And it's a shame because it's a complete lack of respect for other people. And that's just not what I see up there under the core values and guiding beliefs of this region. So uh, we, we really need to, I hate to say it, we may need to post that in more places, but this is just not where we want to be. Um, so it's a, it's a shame we have to talk about it, but that's, that's really where it is. I don't know if anyone has any comments they care to make or uh, questions or anything like that. Lisa? Oh, you're on. Yeah. I, oh, never mind. It's okay. Let me. It's just a quick question. Is anybody unmuted? Oh, thank you. Was there anybody from Chapag who participated? I, I saw the very strongly worded letter from the principal, which I thought was excellent. But was everything okay at, with Region Twelve? Like nothing happened. We, we did have a, a couple of students who participated in the devilish licks, which was to um, vandalize parts of school. Um, so things like removing a soap dispenser and oh, throwing it, okay. but then we also had some removals of signs. Um, and I will tell you, we held those um, students accountable. Good. They were accountable financially to replace it. Mm -hmm. um, and some actually had to um, actually participate in fixing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is one where right. we did not want this to be something that became prevalent. We have a wonderful school, and I think Mr. Shell did a great job of saying he hates sending out a message to the, the school population when this is really such a small percentage. But it is also one that we want the people to know that, you know what, this, this is not going to go unchallenged. Mm -hmm. This would have financial ramifications. So if you get handed a bill, it's not because you were not forewarned about participating in these challenges. And we have zero tolerance for any kind of physical aggression against our staff or another student. Mm -hmm. And you know, so for us, as students make their choices mm -hmm. on whether or not they feel that their social media presence needs to be elevated through these things, we want them to know without a doubt that here's how we're responding as a school. It is not acceptable. And um, again, the more that we make certain that people know it's not acceptable, yeah. hopefully they're not making the choice to participate in something that is just not lawful. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, action items. First action item, consider and if appropriate, assign board members as liaisons to PTO and agri-science advisory. Can you yeah. speak to this? Yeah. yeah. Julie, would you mind speaking to this? No, not at all. This is something that we discussed in our long range planning meeting. And it's something that we've been doing at the Burnham School for quite a few years. And it came up that perhaps this is something that we should standardize across all the schools. And essentially it's as, as far as the school pieces, the advisory board is different, but it's somebody on the board who would be willing to be the liaison with the PTO and the liaison role is not all that prescriptive, but it is, communicating with both the president and or the secretary, submitting information to the PTO meetings, whether it's a written statement about an update from the Board of Ed, or if it's attending the meeting and giving an in-person update about the goings on of the Board of Ed. And it's also being sort of a listening ear to listen to parents, 
and what they might have to say as a Board of Ed member. So it's been, I think, a very good uh, way to have a relationship with each of our PTOs and have that connection with the board. And after discussing it at our last meeting, we felt that it's something that maybe we should standardize across all the schools. I guess what uh, John. Yeah, Julie, was there any discussion about potentially the PTO president uh, coming and making a presentation to the board uh, periodically or? Uh, we didn't take it to that angle. We were just simply talking about how to develop a relationship between the Board of Ed members and the towns and the local PTOs. And we feel that it is good to have that relationship. And this is a nice, like I said, not real prescriptive, somewhat informal, but good relationship. And it's, again, about communication. It's about listening. Often our board members attend their fundraisers or their community events, and it just has worked out well at Burnham. And we thought it would be nice to see if there's a board member from the other towns that would be willing to play that role for the other two communities and at Chapag. Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, perhaps it, you know, it would be good to um, get some feedback from, you know, the troops on the ground, the, you know, some constructive criticisms or whatever from, from PTO who hears from the parents directly. So that's all. Yeah, agreed. Um, I just want to say I, I really like this idea. And I was just talking to Justin about it that um, years ago when I was on the PTO, we would have board members come periodically and give a report. And having that rapport was really important. And just knowing that they were there and that we'd give a report and an update. I think it's really important, Julie. So I'm, Justin and I were just talking about that as well, that we would like to start attending those meetings and just, you know, either we go together or divide up our time. But um, I definitely agree with that. Okay, great. So we've got two co-volunteers from Roxbury. <laughs> Yeah, if, if this is something that's interested, you know, of interest to you, uh, now I've heard it from Roxbury, so we uh, we we can we can stop there. But uh, please see me and uh, or contact me or send me something, and we'll uh, we'll get these positions appointed. I think it's a great idea. Um, guess they also one of the things that is one of the requirements is the Agri Science Advisory Board right. does need board representation. So as we start to make the decision on how we're formalizing some of these things and where energies are gonna go into, um, that's one that can't be overlooked. So there's something for Chapog, but Chapog also has an advisory council for um, our agri-science program. All right, so if you're interested in any of these, Alex. Um, I, uh, ironically, Bridgewater has its PTO meetings the same day as we have our board meeting. They just had one today at 3.30. Um, I went to one, uh, the one previous to it, and I just thought I'd bring out one of the things that they asked about was when can we get our kids from the elementary school up to see the agri-science program? They're dying to come up here and uh, see the animals and the facilities and all. I'm not sure if it's the kids as much as the parents, but uh, uh, I think that's something we should consider. I know that Julie has been giving uh, reports to the Bridgewater PTO for, I don't know how long, but for a long while. Um, and I'd be willing to try and uh, go to some of the meetings too. So um, it uh, is, they have them outdoors behind the building and it was raining today, so I didn't want to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Alex. That's great. Okay. All right. Good. So please uh, come see me or, or or give me a call if you uh, if you if you're interested in any of these any of these positions, especially the ag science ones, which we need to fill. Um, so do you feel like we need to take a motion on it to formalize it, or at this point do we want to keep it casual and we'll take it off the action? Um, well, I I don't think we need a motion to appoint people. I you know I think these are well. 
I, I think I can just appoint these people. Um, it, treat it, we'll treat it like a committee, uh, like a committee assignment, or, or like the liaison to uh, that we used to have to CAVE and that we still have to uh, advance. Okay. Would you like to have then a standing agenda item in which we put PTO updates and that puts then our board members reporting back out? That. Yeah, um, I hate though to have a, a situation where we, we call for it and then people say, oh, well, there's nothing this month, there's nothing this month. So we, we'll figure out a way to do it because I'd like to have that more front and center uh, at the board meetings. I want to make sure we've heard what people are saying. That's one of the reasons I think this is a tremendous idea because you know, if you don't know what people are thinking and you don't understand where the parents are coming from, I think that puts us at a disservice. And I think we need to we need to hear that. And the PTO is a good place to get that. It's not the only place to get it, but it's a good place to get it. So I think we should we should definitely have those. We should definitely plan on some reports. I'm not quite sure how to do it. Uh, I don't know if we want four reports every meeting or we just want to sort of cycle them through uh, in a little bit more uh, protracted fashion. Yeah, uh, Jen? Um, prior to COVID, I would attend the Chapag PTO meetings. Um, and what also I think was really helpful is that parents that were there was an opportunity for board members to discuss sort of the hot button issues or what's going on. And I think it, it's a it's a it's a great relationship that goes both ways when we want to be able to convey information kind of firsthand and also also hearing about the concerns that they may be having as well. So I, I think it's a great idea to continue and to strengthen. So okay, good. We Greg? will do that. Um, Greg? I'm sorry, Julie. I'm sorry, just you. one other potential idea. I remember, I think the last uh, chairperson only had committees report out like every other meeting. So perhaps one meeting could be committee reports and one meeting could be our PTO reports just so that we don't have so much time where there's not that much to update. So just, just a thought on how we might be able to incorporate it without lengthening our meetings more than they are. No, that's, that's, that's probably a good idea. What I had, uh, what I was sort of had in the back of my mind as we were talking about it is that we would, we would have the PTO and, uh, and, the, and, and the ag science folks uh, communicate with either Megan or myself to let us know whether they've got some developments, things they wanna do as far as committees are concerned, maybe we could go back to surveying the committee people to see whether or not they have anything to report. Uh, and I think we can probably fit it in. I don't have a problem fitting it in. We'll get it done. Um, uh, I'm not quite 100% sure how, but we'll get it done. Okay. Uh, the second action item is to consider, and if appropriate, approve the disposal of Region 12 property as listed. Um, we saw a list a while ago. Do we have we a did. new it's list? It's a new list, and there's 65 new items on it. Um, and, and, and they all came from the planetarium? There is a planetarium thing that we need to dispose of, yes. Um, we want to get our staff into the healthy practice of making certain that we are maintaining. We're purging when we don't need to have it. Um, so the disposal list is currently things that are owned by uh, Region 12 schools. And we'd either like to, with you disposing of it, we would make the decisions on whether or not it's able to be repurposed to another district. Um, certain times, you know, books and other things, we look to see if there's a district in need, as we did with our smart boards in the past. Um, additionally, we look to do some sellback programs, um, or we just look for obsolete. You know, you'll see on the list, there's VCR that, you know, quite frankly, we don't need them anymore. We're all set. You know, VCR tapes, we're good. Um, but we want to make certain we recognize that this is board property. So twice a year, we're gonna be looking at October and May, and we will constantly provide what is the new list as we then look to make certain um, that we are not maintaining um, our, our storage rooms to be full. Um, you know, storage is of the premium. And so the more that we get on a rotation, the more we're thinking in terms of cleaning house and healthy practices. So asking the board to consider if it's okay to recondo this uh, last list. Uh, it should be in the board packet. I didn't see it. Oh my goodness, okay. You see it up on there? 
It, it is under survey because what we do is we have the uh, building administrators put it in. It's a different survey than the last time. So they're just constantly entering. It came in later this afternoon. It wasn't, it wasn't in the original packet. It came in later this afternoon. Okay, so hang on. You want to recognize Mary? Yes, go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry, I didn't have the screen on. Uh, that particular piece of the uh, uh, came in on uh, late afternoon today. Uh, it didn't come in in the original packet. So if you look, it'll probably be there. I only saw it when I looked just before the meeting. Thank you for letting us know the mission. So that's that's why you, some people didn't see it because they were at other meetings. Okay. All right. Uh, do we? Could you yeah turn yours off? Uh, do we have a motion to? Um, approve of the disposal of the region 12 property is listed on the list that was distributed to the meeting. So moved. Uh, moved, is there a second? Second. Moved and second. is there further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? All those abstaining? I'm gonna abstain so people Okay, I have two abstentions. The chairman votes aye. So I don't know what that makes. Do, do we have, uh, do we still have all 12 of us here? Yes. Uh, so it's 10 2, 10 0 2. We can announce that. All right. Uh, one other item that I'd like to just tell you is that the uh, Board of Ed meeting that's scheduled for October 25th has been rescheduled to November 1st. So you're going to want to, uh, this was in the package for, of materials for the meeting. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you adjust your calendar. And also um, Greg, just another- There's nothing else to come before the meeting and right. no one objects. Uh, we will consider the meeting adjourned. It... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go. Greg, I just, I also believe that the long range planning meeting has been changed to November 1st as well from November 8th, just to mark up your latest sheet. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there is no objection uh, and nothing further, we will consider the meeting adjourned by consent at 8.36 PM. Thank you all very much.